Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. I'm very excited today to have Sean Metcalf joining. Sean is an expert, one of the gurus in Active Directory security, and so it's an honor to have him join. So the last time I saw Sean was at GERCON not long ago, and the first time we actually met was, I believe, while it was Hacking Fest in 2022, because some of the members from your team had been on my old podcast, and actually, I guess Rando was the one that introduced me to you. I think that was the first time we'd met. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I think that sounds right. That introduction sounds accurate. I'm I'm terrible with faces, so I, I end up meeting people two and three times, but it's great to meet you yet again. And thank you yeah, for having same. me on the show. I run into that a lot too. You get people come up and you try to remember, they know who you are, but you're trying to remember where, where you met them. And when you go to so many conferences and, and things like that, it's kind of hard sometimes to keep up. Yeah, that definitely. So how has how has your year been so far? Oh, it's been quite up. a year. Uh, lots of a uh, bunch of new customers, some large, uh, interesting environments. I think we uh, assessed an environment with nine hundred sixty thousand users on Active Directory. Um, we've done something close to that on Azure AD, Entra ID. Uh, always interesting environments. Uh, we we have a kind of a mantra within Trimark that if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and looks like a duck, it's probably persistence. So we don't do <laughs> pen tests. We do uh, security assessments of Active Directory and Azure AD, Entra ID. And when we see something that looks unusual, uh, we have to do a kind of a double take in, in the environment and go, all right, is this something an admin would do or is this something an attacker would do? And uh, we found some really interesting things this year in, in that regard around uh, the, the Active Directory space as well as Entra ID. That's very interesting because I've talked to some folks. I haven't experienced this myself, pen testing, but ran into some people that have been performing pen tests and find that someone with the threat actor was already in the environment had already been breached and been there for a while. There are definitely some that we look at and we go, if, if this isn't already compromised, the attackers are not trying hard enough. Um, and that's usually when we'll recommend that the, the customer does a compromise assessment uh, while they're, while they're getting these things fixed that we've identified uh, because we're not like running bloodhound or any sort of tool. We have our own proprietary internal uh, custom tooling that we use for our assessments. So it, it, really lays out quite a map of what the issues are and what, what the potential problems are, which enables us to, to really look at the environment very, very much in depth, but over the course of a, a quicker time frame than, than what, what uh, such a comprehensive in, uh, investigation of the environment would normally take. Well, very interesting. So before we get too far in the conversation, I have all my, my guests share their hacker origin stories. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your origin story of, of how you started out up into where you are now. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that question, Philip. So uh, <laughs> where did I start? Um, I let's probably goes back to when uh, my credit union gave me a credit card, and this is probably twenty years ago, uh, maybe maybe a little bit more. And I noticed that when I logged into the credit union website, and then I clicked on the button to view my uh, actual credit card number. I saw something change in the URL. And so I went and looked at the URL and it was actually the credit card number uh, in full that was passed as part of the URL header. Um, and I said, that probably shouldn't be that way. So I had to kind of bounce around and talk to different people at the credit union and then ultimately at the uh, their MasterCard division to figure out why it was doing that and it should not do that. Uh, Cause that wasn't, didn't seem like it'd be a good, it was a good idea. Um, so that got me itch really interested in like the security side of it. I was working on an Act Directory project at a large organization with um, about 1,000 domain controllers wor worldwide. And uh, I think it was about 10 domains, 150,000 users. And that's really where I, the environment I cut my teeth on, so to speak, in the Act Directory world um, and looking to see what the potential issues were there. Well, we had a team of 12 people that were very senior, um, very well established. We knew exactly what we were looking at really good at operationalizing things. Problem is that the migration team 
uh, was in a mode of let's get this environment flipped over from NT4 into Active Directory as quickly as possible. And so we ended up with a lot of issues from a security perspective. And that's what really got me looking at the security side of things because the security team at this organization um, historically had not really looked at well, Active Directory as as a as a security thing, uh, but globally across all the env uh, environments, it was very endpoint focused, which is how a lot of security teams operate even even today. And so I noticed that uh, there were a lot of accounts that should not have privileges. And so when I did a, a, a search for admin count equals one, I found that there were dozens of thousands of accounts that had that set, which means that at some point they had been t uh, stamped by the admin SD holder proper, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, property uh, function that runs on the uh, primary domain controller, the PDC. And that meant that at some point these accounts were effectively domain admins, which is problematic, obviously. So uh, I started looking into, into the security of that. Then many years later, uh, ended up having to be involved in a few different um, Few, a few different IR efforts uh, in, in getting an, uh, the attacker out of environments uh, in Active Directory and uh, Azure AD, Entry AD. So I would say probably uh, my start came from the, that beginning, looking at the credit card and seeing that in, in the URL to uh, Active Directory getting deployed broadly in, very, um, in a large environment uh, without a lot of security being, being focused on. And then cutting my teeth on again in another way, working against these adversaries that had compromised these environments. Um, and then after that, around that time is when I started uh, adsecurity.org and had started um, actually push, putting things out on social media. Very cool. Actually, adsecurity.org is actually how I originally found out about you. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> Um, funny story about how I got my handle. Uh, so my handle is Pyrotech with a K, number three. Uh, three is a lucky number for me, so it, it had to be three. And uh, the uh, Pyrotech part of it came from, uh, I, I picked up the nickname Pyro many years ago for a way that anyone would assume that I did. Um, there was a uh, birthday party and I was I was tasked with a grill, which I had not done before. And so it was one of those little portable Weber grills so we put it on a uh, one of those wooden TV tray tables, and I put um, a, a, a towel over the, the table and then put the, the grill on top of that to protect it. And I'm spraying the, um, the, the liquid, uh, ignition liquid onto it, uh, as you do with, with all of the, the, the briquettes there. And then when I lit that sucker, it lit up. I had not realized that it had basically, the, most of the liquid had drained into the towel and so the <laughs> towel itself was containingless, and it had a little bit of a, a seg section between the towel and the um, and the actual uh, grill unit itself because it was a portable one, so it was small. And it just like had this nice little flame ball went up, and uh, I, I didn't lose too many uh, eyebrows uh, hairs <laughs> in, as part of the the uh, the episode. But uh, Pyro was my nickname since then, and uh, it's it is stuck. So Pyrotech was an easy way to go. Uh, when I was setting up my handle on Twitter. Very cool. Yeah, I think most of the folks we've had here have have shared their hacker origin stories, but I don't think I've had anyone share their their origin of their handle. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so what kind of got you to to focus more on Active Directory? Well, I uh, was hired by a company as a consultant. So I work in the D and live in the D.C. area, Washington D.C. area. So here it's government and you know, big businesses. And so I was pulled into a contract that was involving a large act directory environment that was getting deployed. So I contributed to the act directory design, same, same setup, uh, about a dozen domains, 150,000 users, a thousand domain controllers globally. And that was where I really started figuring out this act directory thing. Uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I went after the Microsoft certified master certification, got certified. Uh, it had, had like a 10 to 20% pass rate. And when it got passed over to Microsoft Learning, they finally just shut it down because they're like, the pass rates aren't good enough for their metrics. And so I passed that going through, which most of the folks, most of the folks that have the MCM 
uh, for Active Directory are at Microsoft. Uh, I would probably say that most of the people that are MCMs in general probably are at Microsoft without maybe some, some niche areas or not. Um, but getting that and then using that certification to help propel my career forward um, it, with a focus on Active Directory security seemed like a good niche at the time. And this was right around the time that the Golden Ticket had come out in 2014. So the timing was very serendipitous for me because now all of a sudden there's a focus on, hey, Active Directory security is important. And at the same time, that seems to be what I'm doing and that's what I'm focused on. So it really worked out quite well. It seems like a sm that's a good way to go for folks because I see so many people try to do everything for so long. And it mm -hmm. seems like to really get good, you need to kind of focus on one area and not try to be good at all of it. Because for me, it's impossible to be good. at. Some people can pull it off, but I don't think that many can. Well, I've been working with Active Directory pretty much since it came out. And there's plenty that I don't know about it. I, I knew way more about it when I went through the MCM pro program, uh, <laughs> where it was a two-week, uh, very intense uh, of information that was provided to you, but you had to already know it well in order to be successful. Uh, because, for example, they covered PKI from a 100 level to the 500 level in eight hours. And so if you weren't already up on PKI and understood it, then you weren't going to be able to pass the, the, the course. Uh, and the person who was teaching the PKI component was the person who run, ran PKI at Microsoft at the time. So that's who the, the instructors were, were these very you know, technological experts at Microsoft, the ones that actually ran or managed their teams or had gone out and worked with very large customers like Exxon, et cetera. And so the, uh, Exxon, Walmart, and some of the other big ones. So when, you, when you're dealing with that level of, of, of folks, um, it's an incredible amount of information and knowledge transfer. And I think uh, the weeks after that, it just seeped out of my brain. So. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Actually, I used to be a sysadmin, so... I remember life before Active Directory. I was start out. Actually, I got my start with Novell, so Novell Directory Services. I remember Novell. I, I yeah. did work with Novell a little bit. Yeah, and just the, for anyone is, for anyone listening that that may not have the history or know, but back before Active Directory, Microsoft Direct. I mean, Act, uh, Novell Directory Services was the predominant directory services. Although there was Banyan Binds to I don't know how, I don't think that was as widely used, but I remember it's, Banyan. But it's once Microsoft came out with their directory services, they seemed to pretty much take over the market with yeah. as far as network operating systems go. Yeah, I remember Novell Network 4. I was certified in 4, certified 5. I think once it went to 5, they kind of lost their way. Um, Zenworks to this day, I think, is probably the best product out there for managing endpoints. And it's a shame that that kind of just disappeared. Yeah, they had some pretty interesting products. They had one security, some, I'm trying to remember the name of it. They had some kind of gateway product that was IP to the internet and IPX, SPX internally. So that was kind of smart because you got in there to IPX, SPX, you're not going to do anything from the internet. So that was kind of an interesting product. Yeah. So for those listening, TCP IP is what we use now for networking, which you're familiar with. But Net NetWare ran IPX, SPX, which was a different networking protocol. And the two did not talk the same language, so to speak. So you had to have a gateway to, to tr translate. And that's a pretty pretty nifty way to, to have security. It's almost like NATing, you know, when we have the limited number of IP addresses, but the number of IP addresses have exploded, but we still have not run into a, the IP v4 crunch that we thought we were going to be in because of things like NATing and, and other, other proxies. Pretty interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting things how things have evolved. So, basically, what what is your perception or your opinion of how things have evolved with Active Directory over the years, and and now intra ID and uh, and more of the cloud based stuff? Well, we are making the same mistakes that we made on prem in the cloud. Um, effectively, a lot of organizations are just taking what they've done on prem and doing that in the cloud, and we're making the same mistakes. I mean, at Trimark, we assess environments with Active Directory and Azure AD and Tri-AD. So we see both sides of it in a lot of customers. And it doesn't matter, Fortune 20, Fortune 50, and beyond, everyone is making the same mistakes as they made originally when they're on-prem environment. Um, there's overprivileged uh, standard user accounts. There's service accounts that have tremendous amounts of rights. Um, we have uh, people using regular web browsers to manage their entire Azure AD environment. Uh, we have customers that that want to run uh, 
their standard user account as global admin or equivalent um, because they're using PIM. And so we have to explain like that's not the boundary there. So it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I've been focused on Azure AD, Entry ID since probably around 2016, 2017. And uh, Microsoft has ported over a lot of the kind of functionality that we had in Act Directory to Azure AD, Entry ID. Uh, so for example, we didn't have nestable groups in Entry ID until uh, Microsoft decided to create the role assignable group. Well, at least they didn't just create, a, say, that, oh, you can put any group you want to into, say, Global Administrator, uh, uh, that role itself. Basically, they say, well, you can create a role assignable group that only a global admin or a privileged role administrator can create, and only they can manage it. But the thing is that the owner of that can actually manage the membership, and you can delegate that out. So, of course, companies do that, and they delegate it out to non-global admins, and, and you have an escalation path. So it's it's uh, crazy out there. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, the whole Microsoft world, because I remember, like, with NT4.0, and earlier how it was kind of unlocked and you had to kind of lock it down. And then with Windows 2000 came about, then they were more locked down. You had to kind of, you know, allow what you wanted to allow, which was kind of a better concept than the way they originally did it. I do remember that. Yeah. And I also have <laughs> d done my work with STIGS, the uh, defense standard for, for Windows NT in 2000, 2003. Um, that was always fun, having to STIG a system and then unlock and unblock a bunch of things so you can make make it usable again. Yeah, pretty pretty interesting to see all the whole Microsoft uh, ecosystem, how things have changed. Because remember back in the day when they used to have before APIs, how they had middleware servers and Microsoft had BizTalk, was it? Was it I remember Microsoft? BizTalk, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of interesting, interesting times. And, and trying to manage Microsoft servers before you really had Active Directory and stuff, it sure made things a lot more difficult. Because like one time, I think we were we were fighting the NIMDA virus. We had the NIMDA virus oh in our my. environment. We had to like RDP or hands-on console to every single system. And <laughs> wow. Yeah. I remember that. I remember the, the viruses that would, that would take advantage of outlook and exchange. You don't see that so much anymore, but attackers are definitely using uh, uh, email rules on outlook in in order to uh, leverage persistence in interesting ways. So you say you do, you get, you do uh compromise assessments. So, uh, what are some of the interesting things you've done, seen in those assessments of things that, that you know, where threat actors have got a foothold environment? So we don't do compromise assessments. We recommend okay. them if we see that the, the customer has, uh, has something that looks unusual or has a lot of problems. Uh, we do security assessments where we look at the configuration settings in Active Directory and Azure AD, Entry ID, and map those, those configurations and how the environment is set up and map that to what attackers can actually do in the environment. So when we see some interesting things that are, for example, um, the pre-Windows 2000 group, uh, pre-Windows 2000 compatible group is, uh, has been granted certain rights at the domain root that are similar to the rights that DC Sync and DC Shadow leverage, then we go, that's a problem. That's likely persistence. Now, Very interesting. Our, our, our viewpoint isn't looking to find the compromise or co find a threat, uh, the, the actual threat actor that's doing things. So we're not there to say, hey, you're compromised. We're there to say, this is the best way to actually secure and tighten up your environment. Uh, we did have a customer that during the process of reaching out to us and then later on actually getting an assessment, uh, when we did the assessment, it was after they were compromised. So they were compromised in between those times there while they're still doing the contract paperwork and everything else. So our actual assessment was pushed back while they dealt with the, the compromise and evicting the threat actor. Then they brought us in, and after we did our work, they said, "Yes, we wish we had been able to get you in sooner because you would have been you would have identified those things that the the attacker had leveraged." So, it is one of those things that's important. Um, pen tests are important. Security assessments are important. Looking at these configurations because attackers will leverage them. So, what's kind of the just you know because you mentioned earlier Bloodhound that you have your own tools and stuff. So, what's What's the advantage of using Trimark over like using Bloodhound? Oh, you're going to do that to me, huh, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> so Andy and Rohan and Will are friends of mine. They're the ones who created Bloodhound. Uh, and I'm big fans of the Bloodhound, Bloodhound, uh, the Bloodhound project, the community edition, as well as the Bloodhound Enterprise product, which is a paid edition. Um, they're, they're similar, but different. Um, they're, they're similar in that uh, 
we're, we're both looking at Act Directory and trying to figure out where the issues are. Um, the Trimark approach is more from the configuration le level, so more of up here, like in the Act Directory cloud, so to speak, at the service level. What they're looking at are those, those connection points of the different objects, um, users, computers, groups. If a user on this computer is compromised, where can it go? What can it do? And with uh, Bloodhound, as Bloodhound has evolved and become more of a defensive tool than it was originally uh, an offensive tool, uh, it's it's evolved to the point where you can go, all right, show me all the paths to domain admin or show me all the paths to this. Bloodhound is still looking at those relationships. And so it's based on that relationship mapping and identifying that. So there are some overlap that's going to happen between a Trimark assessment and what Bloodhound's looking at. The thing that's different, though, is we're looking at root cause analysis and we're looking at hundreds of checks beyond what Bloodhound is focused on. Um, so we're looking at things at the core act directory, as well as those core settings and relationships uh, from the perspective of how do you connect dots. Um, so it's a little bit different. There's a, there's some overlap, but for the most part, we're complementary in the way that we're looking at things. Well, Bloodhound's very much looking at lateral movement. Trimark is very much looking at the, the service itself. And just to kind of, yeah, I actually had Andy on the podcast, I think is right around the time uh, Bloodhound Enterprise was launched. But for the listeners, and just to add to what you're saying, you know, Bloodhound is a tool, whereas Trimark's offering you a service. So it's beyond just you trying to interpret what the tool detects and so forth. Absolutely. So you get our expertise behind the answers that are in the report and um, what we detail as, as far as what the roadmap is and how to fix those things. And we make that very easy and actionable in order to get those things resolved. Shouldn't say easy, straightforward. Yeah. And that's one of the things too, that this kind of could be a challenge sometimes. I know from like the pen testing world, people getting assessments of that type, sometimes the remediation is not that detailed and a little more research on the end of the end user to figure out how to, to remediate those items. Absolutely. So to, to answer your question, what's the value in Trimark? Uh, we have the expertise. We are the identity security experts from a Microsoft perspective in Act Directory and Azure AD, and we've been recognized that by others. And so with, with a Trimark assessment, you get that knowledge and expertise based in, baked in. Whereas if you have someone read Bloodhound, they might have a lot of Act Directory knowledge or they might have a little Act Directory knowledge. Very cool. And that's, yeah, getting someone the expertise in, in Active Directory is, is very important. So if someone wanted to get started, like, you know, wanted to do what you're doing, Active Directory security, how would you recommend they get started? Uh, read 80 securityorg um, th There's a page that has at the top, I forget exactly what I called it, but it's a reading library and it's all the, th all the important documents. Basically, when I went through the Microsoft Certified Master Program, um, one of the guys who I went through the program with was promoted to be the person in charge of the next iterations of it. And so we were, we were gearing up for 2012 at that point, 2012, 2012 R2. And I was asked, I'd reach out to him and said, hey, Dave, if you need any help, let me know. I'm happy to help. So he reached out to me and I actually wrote questions for the MCM, the 2012 version, and uh, actually went through and on contract, uh, created a reading list for 2012 and wrote, helped co-write questions. So I was involved in all the question writing for the MCM for Act Directory and for the 2012 version just before Microsoft decided to kill it. So... Those reading that reading list that I have up there on 80security.org is basically the reading list that I had put together um, for the the Microsoft Certified Master Program for Active Directory. So there's not information that, that's that's the thing that I think is important to remember. Um, I worked with a Microsoft uh, Premier Field Engineer PFE, one of the Microsoft folks on site, and one thing that he said to the uh, customer that I thought was a really great thing to say said, you know, the PFEs don't necessarily have different knowledge. They're just, they've read ahead in the book. So they've already read ahead and through the chapter. All this information about how Active Directory works is document. It's the documents are there. It's a lot of reading. I read over a thousand pages of text prepping for the MCM because like I said, it was very in-depth, very detailed and very fast paced. So if you didn't already know things, you were going to fall behind. Um, the, 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 training program part of it was more to make sure that you were at the right level, assuming that you already had had gotten to a 300 and 400 level of expert knowledge 
for in most of the areas that, that we're covering. I'm not a PKI expert. I'm not the best good PKI. Act Director Certificate Services is not something that I've ever really had to touch or use because all the customers that I worked with had their own Entrust PKI deployment, which is then pretty much the industry standard. But the the level of knowledge was so intense that you have to go through. If you want to learn Active Directory, go to adsecure.org, uh, read all the posts by the Spectre Ops folks, and that will get you to uh, probably 80% of what you really need to know and, and what you need to be looking at from an Active Directory security standpoint. So how important is scripting due to, to this type of work? Scripting oh, or, 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 or coding? <laughs> hey, Philip, you're kind of good at this. <laughs> um, great question. So I would, th I would say that it is advantageous for people to understand how to do PowerShell scripting, PowerShell coding. If you're talking about Act Directory as, as a thing to go after. Um, if you're not going after Act Directory specifically and you more broadly... Um, looking at the uh, environment, looking at how uh, the environment is working. Python is a great tool for that because there's a lot of a lot of tools that are published in Python, especially for folks in InfoSec. Um, I would say that it's important to understand the mechanics of scripting. I wouldn't say that it's necessary or 100% something you have to know, but it will definitely help you out in your career if you're able to take someone else's code and adjust it a little bit and make it so it works better in your environment or does the thing that you need it to do. Um, I challenged myself to learn PowerShell. And at the time we were up, upgrading domain controllers from 2003 to 2008, uh, 2008 R2. And PowerShell was already on the system. And I'm like, well, I have this. I could just use this. So what I did was I created a PowerShell script that would query the information about the existing domain controllers, write it to an XML file, which I had never done before, and then figured out how to then have a second script that would then be the build script. And it would basically take the information from the XML file, all the configurations that are set up for that server, and automatically set those up and then pass it over to DC Promo uh, to promote the server up and, and have it set up the way it, it should have been done. So I took a process that was probably two, three hours and took that down to maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, that was the script that I decided to work on to learn PowerShell. Um, so that that was <laughs> way more than I, I should have tried at the time, but it enabled me to to look at all these different things like, okay, things like time zones. I need to make sure that I have the time zone set correctly on this domain controller. How can I do that through PowerShell? Um, how can I set the, um, how can I check for memory? How, how can I do uh, requirements checks to make sure that the server that's getting built as a domain controller has the correct amount of memory and has the correct configuration, has the right drive letters, and does it have the right amount of space for these drive letters? Uh, so it gave me an opportunity. And so from that, I have been telling students that when they want to learn scripting or learn coding, learn whatever involving some sort of programming knowledge, to have a, journey, have a destination. You have to have a destination. You have to have something you want to try out. For example, you could open up PowerShell right now and use PowerShell to figure out which uh, EXEs on your computer are signed by Microsoft. So that's something you can do with PowerShell right now without having to, you know, write a very complex script. But that's something that can be helpful and something that'd be useful in a job experience uh, type position as well. So I'm sure, I'm sure that all the scripts you've developed has really probably helped speed up your process a lot, especially when you mentioned something that take, took 15 minutes to do what would normally take two hours. Absolutely. Well, the early version of the Trimark Act Directory Security Assessment is built was built on PowerShell that I wrote. So I basically built a company on on my scripting ability, which is not the best. <laughs> Very it cool. It's interesting. It's always interesting to talk to different people and see what people's point of view is on whether you need to know how to script or or, or code compared to those that don't. Because I've seen some people that are pretty good that don't really know scripting and coding, but then you see you know, you mentioned kind of Spectre Ops. You look at some of the tools that they've developed over there. And just one of the things I've kind of, for my opinion, is if you really want to make it to the next level and be really good, that it's pretty important that you learn some scripting or some coding because it can kind of take you to the next level. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's kind of like learning and knowing how to drive a manual transmission, a five-speed or six-speed transmission uh, vehicle. Uh, it's not that important if you stay in the U.S., but if you go overseas and you're going to rent something, you're, you're probably going to end up with a manual transmission or you're going to have to pay extra for an automatic. And so 
it's one of those things that could be very, very useful. It could be very helpful in your in your career, or it could be something that you don't necessarily need to use in your role, the, the role that you have. But I think that it's one of those things that's nice to have in your toolkit where you understand how it works. But just like using a language, if you're not coding on a regular basis, it's gonna it's gonna get lost. Um, Jake Hildreth on on the Trimark team has published uh, a couple of tools, actually three now. A locksmith for Act Directory Certificate Services, so it scans through, finds the issues, and then provides the output that you can run and pass to Cert Util to actually fix the issue. Um, so he did that with locksmith. He did that with Blue Tuxedo, which looks at uh, DNS within Act Directory, and he most recently with PowerPug. Uh, which is um, a tool to help get people to implement uh, the protected users group in their Act Directory environment. All three of those tools are free. All of them are on the Trimark GitHub, github.com slash Trimark. Very cool. And it's awesome to see organizations like yours that are, that are sharing the tools with, with the public. Absolutely. One of, one of the, the key goals that I have with Trimark is to help out the community as well as to help our customers. Yeah, that's good stuff. And that's one of the things that I really like to see companies like yours that do share with the community and have, have you know, because, you know, some com some companies don't have the budget for some of those things. So it's great to do that and, and yeah, inspire others days. as well. Yeah, especially these yeah. days. Yeah. We actually published a free PowerShell tool that could help companies um, perform their own security uh, review of Act Directory in 2020. That summer of 2020, when ransomware was really starting to run rampant, uh, we published a, 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 a PowerShell script on how to check these things in a full article, which is probably about eight pages, eight to 10 pages. And then in the past couple of years, we also did a webcast called Improve Your Act Directory Security More Quickly in Your Environment. So the, sh the quick wins that people can, can work through. And then uh, Jim Sikora on the team uh, published an, a white paper that can be downloaded from hub.trimarksecurity.com for free. And we don't, we don't do any, there's no registration required or anything like that for it either. That's nice. You don't see that very often nowadays because it makes you think the conferences too, like the day after conference is unsubscribe day because yeah. then you get hit yeah. up by all the, all the vendors. And, and it's kind of funny working on the vendor side when you, you see some of the list for the events that companies are hosting and you see the people that use the burner email addresses. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, plus addressing is nice, but it's it's obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's always kind of funny. Some of the marketing folks don't understand, don't get, don't see it or whatever, but it's kind of funny to see all the burner addresses out yeah. there. So. Yeah, well, yeah. we do we do regular webcasts. We just did a webcast last week on um, Act Directory security, the deep dive into Act Directory security elements around the the actual uh, security descriptors, so the, the the permissions that are put on objects in Act Directory and how that works and how to unpack all that and uh so obviously you registered to to join it but we don't put anyone's information into a a big thing or it doesn't get shared with anyone else it's just used in case they want us to reach out to them through our, our email newsletter or they're interested in hearing about what we do um, other than that we don't care like the our perspective is that if someone's interested in what we're doing then they're going to say that they're interested and then therefore we can tell them about what we do but we don't have any need or desire to chase after people who are really just wanted to get that bit of content. And that's why we don't require registrations for uh, the white papers that we have on the website that are free. Yeah, that's great. Cause I've, I've seen companies too, that will put up videos and it'll still, you have to register and the videos could be year, years old. And it, at yeah. some point you just kind of need to remove it from the paywall or the, you know, the registration wall. That way she's freely available because sometimes you got content out there that could bring, you know, visibility to your brand. And if you constantly have it locked in and people have to register for it, it's not yeah. going to be as utilized. And I have no problem with registration, but just put yeah. a little box there saying I'm not interested or something like that. Yes. And then that way they can go, I'm not interested in getting a follow-up. Um, I mean, I've gotten a couple of sales follow-ups from companies that I actually work with. <laughs> And they're like, hey, you visited the website. Did you have any questions? I'm like, no, we already partner with you. I was visiting the website <laughs> to make sure our logo was there. <laughs> so as far as like nowadays, what you're seeing like on-prem versus in the cloud or hybrid environments, what are you seeing most of? And do you think people are going to eventually get away from mostly on-prem? Oh, great question, Philip. Um, it's hybrid all the way. Uh, pretty much everyone is hybrid. 
Uh, there are very few companies now that aren't hybrid that don't have some representation in the cloud. Uh, I would say that uh, I would say at this point, Act Directory, we're not going to see Act Directory disappear anytime soon uh, because there's too many applications that require uh, Act, what Act Directory provides. So Kerberos authentication and TLM authentication. We haven't got rid of NTLM just yet. And the, th the challenge is that all these applications that were built years ago uh, by vendors, those vendors aren't necessarily around anymore. And it costs money to then go through and figure out how to um, re re uh, repackage those applications so that they can work in a cloud-enabled world, uh, such as through federation or you know some sort of uh, web authentication. It's just not something that's, that's easily portable today. Um, now, there are app proxies through, say, Microsoft or Okta or what have you, but those are going to cost money just like anything else is. Uh, so there, there's some ways around it, um, but I think a lot of companies are going to be in hybrid for a while. And unfortunately, a number of those were thinking they were going to go from on-prem AD to Azure AD because they both have AD in the name, and it's, it's, just, not, it's just not simple like that. Yeah, at least one of the things, the nice things about having some cloud uh, instance is the fact with business continuity and disaster recovery. Because, you know, back in the day when everyone had everything at one location, I used to work for a, a mortgage company. We had to do our annual uh, disaster recovery exercises. And and kind of starting out, we really didn't have any disaster recovery planned. And, and we really didn't, you know, hadn't really tested any of the tapes to see if we could actually recover from a disaster. <laughs> tapes yes yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of crazy i worked for this mortgage company and i don't know if you ever know much about mortgage industry but we used to have this system called file net it was like these big magnetic discs oh, i mean wow. they were gigantic and they would store like mortgage data on it so mm -hmm. so kind of crazy and, and thinking of all the all the way having to use the tapes and stuff for backups before and all that <laughs> yeah well I I don't think Act Directory is going anywhere because the companies that have the the resources to actually move away from it have too many dependencies on Act Directory, and the ones that don't have all these dependencies are too small and don't have the resources to then go ahead and make that shift over. So, um, what other, as far as other type of services, if you want to kind of detail what all kind of services you offer. Sure, absolutely. So we perform uh, an Active Directory security assessment, which is a very comprehensive, in-depth assessment at uh, Active Directory. Uh, there's a number of things that we do that are fairly unique in, in that because of our knowledge and experience. Uh, we go through and manually look at certain elements of the, of the Active Directory security configuration, as well as having our tool go through and scan through it. Um, we have subject matter experts that review the reports, so that ensures that it's not just a report done by one person and the quality of the report is defined by that one person, but the quality of our reporting is defined by the process. And that's our tool, our people, and our process, um, such as our subject matter uh, ex so SME review, our subject matter expert review. Um, on the Azure ID and Tri ID side, probably the most interesting thing that we do there is we've identified the highly, pri highly uh, powerful roles and intra ID and categorize those as into what we call levels. Levels are similar to Microsoft's tiering model. So level zero is like a, a tier zero. Uh, we did the same thing with application permissions. So that way, when we're talking about what's going on in the environment, what needs to get fixed, we can say here, this, this is a level zero role or a level zero application permission. So you really need to be careful about w w what sort of rights that has and who has access to that. And we point out how that how an attacker could actually take take advantage of that configuration. Uh, we had one customer where we were talking about talking through the application permissions during the report review process, and they didn't realize that there was a, a group that actually had access to a, 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 an application that was configured with permissions to read the uh, email uh, for all users in their environment. And for them, that was a big concern. Um, so that's something that we we call out and we identify as part of our um, Entry ID, Azure ID assessment. Um, but really, the, the key things that it comes down to is we're the identity experts. We're the ones that have been doing this for a, 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 quite a while. Um, Trimark's been around for over eight years. We hire some of the best talent around um, that have decade a decade or more of experience in in Microsoft identity space. And we're looking at this, and we're we're not just saying, "Hey, fix this one thing." 
and you, you know everything else is solved. Like get rid of NTLM and everything else is solved. It's not like that. It's it, we look at the layers. We talk about if there's one one can, one um, key security feature that you have enabled, and someone can bypass that, then that one doesn't matter. So let's assume that one gets bypassed, and let's see what what other layers we can put in in, in effect. Uh, and that's what we're really good at, and that's why we we have uh, so many repeat customers. Very cool. So how often does someone need to do these type of assessments? Because, you know, pen test, you know, you really want to have, you need to at least, you need to be doing more than annually, but people typically do them annually. So how often do people need to do follow-up assessments? I'd say on the Act Directory side, probably every couple of couple years, if there aren't many major changes. We certainly had customers that have, that have had us come in. We looked at their Act Directory environment, and a year later, they're like, we want to make sure that we know we've cleaned up and see where we're at, how we compare. We have customers that do this every year, um, just as a matter of course. Um, on the Azure AD Entry ID side, probably every year is where we're headed just because Microsoft changes so frequently. I mean, our assessment reporting has changed um, even just in the past few months from where it was in, say, January to, to that point. And this year, it's very different than it was last year because we keep honing in on those things that Microsoft has uh, capabilities around. Microsoft would, will open up default capability. Uh, for example, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, uh, Microsoft had come out come out with this concept of the um, personal Teams account. And so before that, you had to have a work account for Teams to work. Then they said, okay, well, you can have a personal Teams account. But the problem is that they opted every corporate entity into being able to have communication from these personal accounts into their work teams accounts, which means that all of that security that all these companies have built up around email and that being kind of the front door into users' environments uh, was bypassed because now a regular personal teams account could, could connect in. And there's been a number of issues around things that Microsoft has turned on by default. Um, in the actual Azure AD Entry ID environment. And that's something we look at and we provide that recommendation to our customers. Very cool. So we're getting down towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close it out? Um, just that we have a new product that is really cool called Vision, Trimark Vision for Act Directory. Uh, basically, all the key security information that is important to track and be aware of, uh, we're doing through a, a, our first ever product that's a SaaS product. Uh, we're looking to launch officially in the new year. Uh, we're currently in early access and accepted early access uh, applications. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I look forward to to seeing about that and hear more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking time to to join. I know you had a busy schedule and getting into to the end of the year and trying to wrap things up. So I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on, Philip. I'll definitely come back. Oh, you're welcome. It's an honor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.